Thank you for visiting Harvest Anglican Church. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you're blessed by this message, and we hope that you can join us next time we gather. So be sure to look at our website, harvestsc.org, and find the next worship event and join us. God bless you. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And when the Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and covered vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, and you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to him, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person and from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, Deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Jesus Christ. Let me see. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to um, what you have to say to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How's everybody? It's been a while, a few weeks. But God is in control, y'all. I just, I mean, so much of what we've been saying already today. The Lord is good. And He's got this. And today our text um, takes a devi or deviation from what we've been talking about. Uh, we're going back into Mark's gospel again. And, uh, and we've been spending so much time on Jesus, the bread of life. And, and that's been really, really good for us, right? It's been really good and foundational. And I think, you know, intentionally goes into a place now where he begins to look on our hearts. And you know, I think it's really important as us, for us as a church as we continue to kind of walk this out. How are we presenting ourselves to the world as following in Christ? So Mark's Gospel, that's where we are today. And Jesus, once again, is surrounded by religious leaders and crowds. Kind of par for the course in Jesus' life at this point, right? I mean, there's no, like, <laughs> kind of walking into the town anymore and, and just going and find, finding some rest. I mean, there's just people around Jesus all the time. And this time, religious leaders 
come all the way from Jerusalem. So when somebody's going to make that kind of trek, the, the, pot, the pot has officially been stirred. Because that's not just a hop, skip, and a jump. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the religious leaders came from Jerusalem, which is the most elite, if you will, of the, of the religious leaders. And I'll just go ahead and apologize. You know, last week I got into a little bit of character, so to speak. And some people say, oh, don't worry about Travis. You just be, just keep doing what you do. And I can't help myself. I, I kind of find my way into the story. I try to imagine what it must have been like or what Jesus must be thinking or what the disciples must be thinking or what the people must be thinking. And I can't help when I read this text this week of just the frustration that Jesus must have felt you know, can you just see these religious leaders coming into this gathering, you know, with their noses kind of puckered out and, you know, they have this sneer on their face. Can you see that? Like, they're not washing their hands. I, I kind of sensed that. Like, I, when I read the first five verses, I almost felt like the buildup in Jesus' mind. Like, you know, like, this, this, this has nothing to do with hygiene. This is just another burden that you're laying on ordinary people to keep your power grab, to keep your elite status. And I just kind of chuckled to myself. I know my mom said it earlier in our prayer time, I'm a kid at heart, you know, so I have, I have this image of Jesus in his mind, like putting his best Clint Eastwood voice on and saying, go ahead, make my day. Ask me about my disciples' hands. I dare you. <laughs> And sure enough, these, these, these guys say, why don't your disciples choose to walk in the way of the elders? And, and, and then Jesus is like, Isaiah was right to prophesy about you hypocrites. You know, before we go any further, I don't want us to miss how bold of an accusation that is by Jesus in response to the accusation brought by the leaders against him. That's it's a radical thing. People, normal people don't do that. They wouldn't dare to do that. For Jesus to call these leaders of the Jewish people, the supposed shepherds of the people of Israel, hypocrites, is radical and bold indeed. Quite, quite courageous. And that's why they couldn't stand him. They couldn't do anything. Because Jesus commanded the crowds. But these oral traditions that we've been talking that we talked about today, they were passed down from generation to generation. They held a lot of authority in the people's eyes because they were somehow you know, thought of to come from people like Joshua and others. But again, it just seems so obvious that they're all just power plays for these people of elite status to keep their elite status because there were so many traditions, so many laws, the ordinary person's not going to be able to keep up with that. Okay? So this is all why Jesus scathingly calls them hypocrites. They're not, they're not obeying the commands of God. They're not even teaching the commands of God. But I just want to say, I want to step aside for just a minute and say, in fairness to the Jews in Jesus' day, I think we can all relate to having difficulty when somebody comes along and just overthrows our table of traditions. You know? We all know what it's like to be raised in our traditions. I mean, if you don't believe me, try and take my John Denver and the Muppets Christmas Carol album from me every Christmas. You know, see if you can grab that from my, from my hands. Or, or take Andrew Peterson's The Whole Lamb of God. You know, like these things are, are sacred almost to me. Or, or try to, to do uh, a Christmas Eve service without Silent Night. Or try to have Thanksgiving Day without turkey. And see how that goes over. It ain't happening, right? Most of us do what mom and daddy taught us to do. Most of us don't fall far from the tree. You know, we tend to, and I know there's anomalies, I know there's some people like that, but most of us believe how we were raised. It's just always what we've kind of done. And so we give them a little bit of a pass, but at the same time, these teachers should have known better. They should have known better. And I think what these leaders hated the most about Jesus coming against their traditions is they knew that they should have known better. And what Jesus was openly railing and railing against them, and thereby they were really mocking and dismantling their authority and their power against the people. And we know this because Jesus brings out the big 
gun, if you will, of Isaiah. Um, he quotes Isaiah. He says, you know, hypocrites. Isaiah was right to prophesy against you. A lot of prophets had a lot of tough things to say about the religious teachers of the law. They were not teaching. They were not showing the people how to walk in God's ways. Jesus, all he was doing here was really pointing out their spiritual blindness. Meaning if they had seen the law all these years, they'd seen it written, well, they sure didn't understand it. Because their hearts were far from him. Just because they grew up in Jew, a Jew doesn't make them holy. Just as, just as if we're coming from a Christian family. It doesn't make us holy if we're not following Jesus. Their hearts were far from them. They heard all the oral traditions, but like Jesus talks a lot about, you know, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Well, they've been hearing all these oral traditions, but they didn't understand that these were not of God, but of man. So Isaiah and other prophets spoke angrily, often, against these blind guides. Okay? Because they were not shepherding God's people, Israel, not teaching them, holding them accountable to walk in God's ways. They were, they were more concerned about people walking in the tradition of the elders. They were not interested, or they were not seeming to be interested in teaching the people to walk in God's ways. And that's what Jesus had a problem with. And what are God's ways? Love, righteousness, justice, truth, mercy, grace, love. All this stuff. Not doing busy work doing the commands of God or the commands of men, traditions of men. They were adding things to the law. And what John read earlier in Deuteronomy is very important. God strictly commanded people not to add anything to the law or subtract the written law to never do that. And so Jesus exposes their hypocrisy. He exposes them because they weren't even following one of the main laws, which is one of the Ten Commandments. The Fifth Commandment, honor your father and mother. They were, they were perverting that. They were profaning that, defiling that which is holy. And let's face it, this is just so stupid. I mean, it's not like they were concerned with hygiene again. It's not like they were wanting them to wash their hands like our grandmas wanted to wash it, you know, where we foam it up our hands real good, singing row, row, row your boat. And when you're done singing, row, row your boat, your hands are clean. That's not, that's not what they're going for here, okay? All they did was they poured water over their hands, almost like it was more of a, of a rinse than a cleansing. It's a ritual. But something far more sinister was really happening. All this ritual stuff and traditions of men, really, all it really does is smacks of relief, religious elitism. In isolation, thinking that we're more special, thinking that we're more elect or clean, when everybody else is dirty, filthy, particularly when it comes to Gentiles, those outside of Judaism, those you know, people are unclean. It reeks of pride. Pride. And we know how God loves pride. Not. Nah. He can't stand pride. And it stinks of it. So, it, try, it reminds me. Jesus, it, it just drives Jesus crazy. That's why he lashes out so hard. But it reminds me, one time I went on a vacation. and um, So I actually had a Sunday morning off. We were at the beach a long time ago, actually. But, um, you know, I, I was working at a church at the time. So, I used to like to go to church when I didn't have to be in charge of the service, you know, as a worship leader. And I'd like to go and see what other churches are doing. I thought it was good. So we were just kind of sitting around waiting to check out anyways. And uh, so I'm going to church and see what, it's all, see what it's all about. So I went. And I didn't have any real nice clothes. I had tacky shorts and a, it was a nice graphic tee. It wasn't like I was in my bathing suit and flip-flops and a tank top or anything. I remember going to the church and uh, coming towards the entrance. And this guy was really well-dressed. And he just kind of looked at me like the Pharisees would. You know, I was... And I came up to him, and uh, he handed me a bulletin, and he kind of gruffed at me. He said, good morning. We dress up for God around here, son. That's what he said to me. 
We dress up for God around here, son. I think this is really important for us at Harvest about hospitality. It really broke my heart. I just wanted to come and worship Jesus that morning. And yet he was looking at me with such contempt. And I couldn't help but think, how many times, how many years has he been going to church? Because what Bible has he been listening to? What gospel? What song has he been singing to look at somebody like that? And say things like that? I doubt he, in all the years of his coming to church, ever heard a word about loving God and loving our neighbors. He was stuck in his tradition. And you know what came out of him? He was defiled by what came out of him. Because out of his heart, all those things that Jesus listed, it spewed nastiness out of him. He was more concerned with the tradition of men, the, the way that people dress far more then, hey, here's somebody coming to worship Jesus. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. What a sad thing. And I had to feel sorry for the guy. I hope he's changed by now. And I actually prayed for him that day as I walked down the aisle. And, and you know what's funny? I do have to confess that when I went and sat in the pew, I was like, man, I hope I'm sitting in his pew. Because <laughs> I just wanted him to come up and say, hey, you're taking me by me. Anybody ever had that happen before? <laughs> But this is the kind of stuff that just breaks the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God and it also angers Him. It angers Him. And that's why Jesus lashed out so much and brought Isaiah out. Hypocrites. How many times have you heard Christians being called hypocrites? You know, especially when people know that we're supposed to be coming in here to pray and to worship and love it and to worship a loving God. And so when we go out and we act like that, it's no wonder we are honoring people or we're honoring God with our lips when we come in and sing these songs. But if we go out and act like that, what a damage it does to our witness. You know, one time I was uh, having a luncheon. I was invited to a Christian business luncheon and I had a panel of atheists there. And every atheist there was in the way industry, waiting, the hospitality industry. They were usually waiters, waitresses. And they said by far the rudest customers were those who had just come from church. So they would never darken the doors of a church. So God's word from Isaiah. But I also want to point out Amos here. Because Amos is like, don't like take away the noise of your songs. <laughs> you know, we come in here and sing, but God don't want to hear them if we're going to go out and act like that. If our hearts are far from him, if our hearts are spewing hatred and, and, and racism and jealousy and envy and anger and all these things, if our hearts are far from God. It doesn't matter what we say and hear if our hearts aren't changed. True holiness is a matter of inward affection for Jesus. Inward affection that changes us. It's not just about outward appearances or association. We're not holy just because we belong to harvest. We're not holy just because we belong to any church. We can come to church 52 Sundays a year for years and still not know Jesus because we've never truly surrendered our heart to Him and allowed Him to take all those things that Jesus listed, take them all, and we put them to the cross, we surrender them, and He changes that by His Holy Spirit. If we keep holding on to that, we're going to keep acting like that. So we come to Jesus. God looks on our heart and we believe in Him. And we confess all these things that we lay Him down. God knows what's in there. He knows what's in there. You know, this guy loved his tradition. Just because we don't dress like him doesn't mean we're a heathen, right? I love our traditions in the Anglican Church. I love our liturgy. But if our liturgy doesn't have a heart behind it, what is it? It's just empty ritual. It's just words. 
It's our heart surrender to, wholehearted surrender to Jesus. Our worship of Jesus is a, it's the spirit that draws us in to worship Jesus. It's the spirit that changes our heart. I saw a quote this week. True worship must come from the heart. And it must be directed by God's truth. Not all those other things in there. It must be directed by God's truth and His Holy Spirit. Not our ideas, not our preferences. So Lord, give us hearts that burn for You, right? An authentic, wholehearted devotion to You. A buddy of mine shared an awesome devotion the other week with me. And it was about the fruits of the Spirit. And I think that's kind of, it applies. Anybody list the fruits of the Spirit in here? <laughs> All of them. Anyway, um, but the fruits of the Spirit, when we growing in Christ, as we grow in Christ, they begin to manifest themselves in our life, right? As we surrender to Jesus, His Holy Spirit begins to make them manifest in our lives. And so I think this can be very applicable to our sermon today. Because everything that can come out of us, right, is what we say and do that ever increasingly in the world. The defining moments, if you will. And my buddy, as he was talking about this devotion, he said our spiritual fruit, basically, when we're around others, it should be edifying. It should build up one another. In Christ and each other. People should walk away from an encounter with us feeling better about themselves feeling better about the world, feeling better about God. That's our hope. Because ultimately we have a choice, right? Going to the fruits of the Spirit. We can be either loving or we can be a jerk. We can either be joyful or we can be a jerk. We can either be peaceful or we can be a jerk. Or patient, be a jerk. And we can go on and so on and further further as we have to the fruits. But whichever we choose to be, however we decide to walk, it will define us or it will defile us. That's what Jesus is really after. How do people feel after they've been around you? Do they feel edified, built up, or do they feel frustrated or maybe even disgusted? Here's another question. Are we walking with the Lord in such a way as individuals and as a whole where people sit up and say, wow, surely, surely this is a great person or a great church or they're so wise and discerning, caring and compassionate. You know, kind of like what you're saying in Deuteronomy. Surely this is a great nation. Do people say that? Or do they say something else? Or nothing at all? And this brings me to my last thought. The question the Pharisees ask in verse 5 is really at the heart of their attack on Jesus. It's a full frontal assault. Why do your disciples not walk? Dot, dot, dot. And they go on to say in the tradition of the elders. But I'm going to leave that out. Because I want to say, turn it on its head a little bit. And ask if Jesus were being asked today of his disciples. Jesus, why do your disciples not walk in your way? That's a sobering question. But listen, I don't want us walking out of here downcast. There's enough bad news in the world, right? Hear the good news that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. We are not a, a museum for saints. We are a hospital for sinners. And we're coming in here every week laying down some stuff at the cross. We're not perfect. But God is making us more like Him every time we see Him and come to Him. It's still all about Him. We cannot, I don't want us to leave here and say, oh man, I'm just, I haven't been really good lately. I'm going to grit my teeth and try harder. I want us to seek Jesus harder. You know, just, just let Him do the change. Let, let Him make the change in our hearts. Okay? We just have to come to Him and, and, and say, God, give us a new heart. Not one that spews out all this stuff, but one that exalts you. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can transform us, y'all. Okay? Only possible by Him. You know, the saddest thing I ever heard, and it was a churchman that told me this. It's like, well, I'm just an old dog. I'm never, never going to change. <laughs> what, what gospel are we preaching? 
If we say we can't ever change, the gospel of Jesus sets the prisoners free. We believe that. The gospel of Jesus, when we come to him, we're justified forever, but that's not the end of the gospel. The rest of it is we're born again, and the Holy Spirit takes over and begins to shape and mold us and make us into him, into his image. Amen? Anyone can change because, not because we grit, cheat, and try hard, anyone can change because he is able and willing. So we just have to say, here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. <laughs> seal it for thy course of life. Shape me, make me, mold me, use me. Help me to walk in your ways always as Lord and Savior. Help me not only honor you with my lips, but with my lives as well. With my life as well. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.